Functional Medicine at NHS Tayside, Honorary Reader with the University of Dundee and Associate Postgraduate Dean for the East of Scotland region of the Scottish Deanery. His national roles include Chair of the National Advisory Group for Respiratory Medicine, Clinical Lead for Respiratory Care Action Plan for Scotland, Respiratory Lead for the Scottish Access Collaborative's Modernising Patient Pathways Programme, geez that's a long title, and Secretary of the Scottish Thoracic Society. Tom graduated from Cambridge University in 1999 and awarded his MD from Cambridge in 2008, winning the Ralph Noble Prize for his thesis, Optimising Anti-Inflammatory Therapy in Atopic Asthma. Dr. Farden's clinical interests include difficult to control asthma, cystic fibrosis, non-CF bronchiectasis, um, chronic bronchial infection, and I believe also a keen cyclist from my Facebook musings. So I'd like to hand over to Tom. Thanks very much. Um, uh, it was this slight embarrassment that I tell you your your um, your biography is out of date. I'm actually an honorary professor now. Uh, did you not send us the biography? I did not. I don't know who sent you it, but it's, it's, I say slight embarrassment, but I'm proud of it really. Um, uh, although not as proud as my children are. Uh, who are very proud that they can tell in the playground to other people that they're a professor. But actually, the people who are most proud is the patients, interestingly. It was very strange to introduce myself as Professor Farden um, to patients and, until people, the patients started saying it back. And that's really very interesting, I think, sort of psychologically, that they, they're they really pleased for me, which makes me very pleased as well. And yeah, well, 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 thank you. well, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. That's very kind of you to say so. Um, um, and, and they've given the title, so I'm using it. So there you go. Um, <laughs> Um, what my children call me, at least my youngest son calls me, is a niche internet, internet micro celebrity. Uh, um, because you'll know that over COVID times, I suddenly leapt to niche internet micro celebrity uh, for being on Facebook a bit and Twitter, and I was on the telly and various on the radio and stuff. Uh, and it is very much a niche sort of micro celebrity thing. It's all gone away. No one recognizes me anymore. I was recognized in Tesco for a little while, so it was very interesting. I'd be wondering, are you that doctor of the telly? Yep. So. Now then, um, thanks very much for inviting me, I think. Um, when uh, they wrote to me to say, well, I give this talk, of course, I'd be delighted to come and speak to you. Of course, well, what do you want me to talk about? And this title of Life After COVID, and I thought, oh, okay. So do you want, what's on the right, left-hand side of here, do you want to speak about a disease, long COVID, effectively? That's what you're interested in, is it long COVID? A disease that has no diagnostic criteria, has no diagnostic test, has no therapeutic options, might not exist at all. It's hugely in the public eye. There was a Holyrood public inquiry last week about it, hugely in the public eye. I possibly had this disease, but I just don't know because of C, the above, no diagnostic test, no nothing. And we really don't understand it. So if you do want me to talk about that, I've written a talk about that. Okay, because you do get to vote in a minute. The other talk, which I thought about, if you're asking me about life after COVID, is this one, which is how did COVID change the world we work and live in, in terms of being clinicians? Is it an opportunity to reflect on how we manage the pandemic, particularly from a secondary care perspective? What was the challenge that we faced? Were we any good? Did we do it right? Did we do it wrong? And how has it changed what we might do in the future? Because another pandemic is coming. There will be another pandemic in most of our careers. There wasn't one, a major one, for over 100 years, but the next one will be within our careers. So are we going to, how are we going to manage it, and what do we do next time? So I've written that talk as well, and now you get to pick, okay? <laughs> do you want, because I'll do either, I don't mind, do you want to do, do you want the post-COVID patient talk? Talk about long COVID, best I can, a disease which has no evidence base and I don't know how to treat. Or do you want to hear me talk about the post-COVID world, where I muse for 45 minutes about how I think we did and what we did and where it was, and where it might go in the future and where we, where we go next. Vote now, whichever one of these I click, that's the talk you get. If you want both, we're here for a long time. <laughs> You've got to put two hands up. That's... <laughs> okay, so that's, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And who wants the other one? Ooh. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. More people want that one. <laughs> if I'm quick, 
I'll do both. I'm just relieved that you put your paper to me. I thought, I'm going to this talk and put the long COVID, I don't know what the hell it is. And it thinks it's coming up in the news, and I think, <laughs> well, you've missed out on all my all the stuff about how I tell, it, when I tell you what long COVID is. Right, this is only a, a stick, but here is Professor Dilip Nathwani. And this was his leaving do, which happened on, I think, the 18th of February 2020. And here are the ID team hilariously holding up their Corona beers. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we're not wearing face masks. This is all going to be fine. Corona, that's happening in, in, in China. It'll never happen to us. What a laugh. Um, and obviously, what a laugh. So I don't know how to get rid of this thing at the top, is it? Because uh, it's going to be it's going to be over my um oh, going to be over my exciting slides. Oh, oh killed it. Welcome to Zoom. I'll just keep talking. So <laughs> it might disappear. 23rd of January 2020 was the first possible case in Tayside. Um, and at that, that point, we decided we ought to plan what the hell we did, we're, we're going to do with COVID. Um, we had uh, spent the last 10 years coming up with a resilience plan for flu, because we all thought the problem was going to be flu. So everything we did was based on the infectiveness of flu, the R value of flu, how far flu tra travels when you cough and spit it out, what's, uh, what's the best way to ventilate people, what's the treatment for flu, and where will we put people. So we thought that's all right, because flu is the worst thing that could really happen. Mm -hmm. So everything else will be less than that, and we'll be okay. But then when we started to look at it, we realized that when the R value for initial wild-type COVID comes out of being about four or five, and flu is about one or two, we realized this is, this is bad news. The physical COVID pathway within uh, nine wells was the back door of East Block with the one ambulance, which is kitted out with all the hazmat suits on it for Scotland, uh, would come to the back door, they come at the back steps and then plop into Ward 42, um, going past a whole host of different people, including our officers. And, but that was the best thing we had at the time. And then you'll just have to believe me that sometime in February, because this is over the screen now, um, the, we had our first positive case. And the first positive case was so exciting that it was the first positive case in Scotland that they were transferred out to Edinburgh. And they went down to Edinburgh because we were told the optics were good if they were treated in Edinburgh because the ID centre in the Western um, has, has better services. And we went, they went, patient went down, and then we got a phone call from the head of ID in the Western saying, could you please send us your protocol for how to treat COVID? Because we don't have one. So that was perhaps ironic. <laughs> And then we sat, and then, and then I was doing a ward round uh, in AMU, sometime in the middle of all this, and, uh, and Emma, my wife, Emma, who you know is the GP at Hawk Hill, she phoned me up and said, I think I've got someone with COVID. I said, really? And it turned out that the university was, had, um, had an exchange program with, uh, with the university in Wuhan. <laughs> uh, and their faculty, who've just flown over to prepare the course for the Chinese students who are coming had just been to Chinese New Year. So they're in Wuhan, Chinese New Year, big party, and they flew in here and the first one arrived and went to see Emma and said, I've got a bit of a cough. So she phoned me up and said, what do I do? So I kind of hit a big red button and said, this is, this is, this is serious, this is gonna happen. So within two days, we had then, by the 11th of March, we had activated our COVID plan because we started to see positive cases. And what happened was East Block went from being the respiratory outpatient department uh, to being the COVID admissions unit, bang, like that. And we set up all these rooms and we had oxygen concentrators and we had a path, physical pathway. So these five rooms would be where people would be assessed and what we do. We had this, this excellent, clear plan of what was going to happen. And all of the doctors and nurses and admin staff were taken out of East Block like that, literally in four hours. We were there with like trucks, you know, the big trucks you have for, in the garden. We just put our laptops and PCs and God knows what else, and we carry them upstairs to the improvement tenement because we were told that being in that area where all the COVID people will be coming by would be very, really, really dangerous. We shouldn't do that. And we all went into one big room in the improvement academy, all right? Not far off the size of this room, maybe three quarters of this room. And we were all plonked in that room and we basically hot shared that space for the first five, six months of COVID. And of course you realize what 
you know, now you look back and think that was madness. But at the time we thought it would be better to not be in that area where all the COVID was and be up somewhere else where there'd be no COVID, not thinking at all, of course, one person brings COVID into the space and then everyone has it. So already our carefully planned out thing was just all to shit. <laughs> and what's that quote that Mike Tyson says? Every game plan lasts until you get punched in the face. And that's what happened here. Because within the first two weeks, I got COVID, Robin got COVID, Morgan got COVID, Richard got, you know, in that round and round it went. Just like that, bang, everyone's got COVID. So we had just the wrong idea from the get. And what that meant is we had to change things really, really rapidly. And we had, and there are people in this room who did far more than I did about the, the rapidity and of changing systems, how to changing how people are seen in the community, how do you do the swabbing, how do you do the vaccinating further down the line, you know, the whole nine yards. But how quickly all that changed, I still look back to that and think it's absolutely phenomenal. And my recollection of, of the first few weeks before I got COVID, then being off and then coming back again, is just how much goodwill there was in that time. Because everyone just went mucked in straight away when we realized how bad it all was to, to muck in and get things sorted. And then the willingness people had to change what they were doing. And I'm going to talk in a little bit about flip flops, flip flop medicine, which we did an awful lot of. Um, by September of 2020, we thought that was wave one was over, and we thought that was pretty much it. You know, wave one gone. We need to get these vaccines sorted, and we'll all be all right. And we got through it. It's okay, everyone. We're through it. But and obviously, it's taken a lot longer than that. And uh, there we go. So what went really well? Well. The collaborative approach that we that was taken, I think, was 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 really an amazing thing, and I, and you know I, I look back to that time and and yeah you know, I went suddenly to doing thirteen hour night shifts in AMU. Um, we had you know, camping beds set up so we could stay sleep in the, because we were so knackered and could drive home as consultants, and it felt very much like it did when I was a registrar and that sort of camaraderie and everyone pulling together and. And was was quite an amazing thing, and and I look back on that and think uh, that that is quite an emotional thing. Um, but then we were really hampered by things like the physical restraints of the building. I've always, you know, we we moved out of our single rooms, which would have been a lot safer, into a single big space like pool, um, and we would never do that again. But in terms of getting the patients in and out, you've been to AMU. It's right in the middle of the hospital. It's possibly the worst place to see people in terms of admitting some of people with viral stuff. So all 42 became that spot, but then you can't keep everyone there. So we'd be, we'd be very nicely enclosed in, in, in Ward 42. And they say, right, fine, now you need to go to the COVID ward, which is Ward 17. So you're going along a big long corridor. I need to go to HGU, which is now in the Burns unit, which means it's like it's about three quarters of a kilometer, literally. Of, and we, we had you know, strange things of people in full FFP3 masks and goggles and all the gubbins running down corridors with patients to get them quickly to HGU to, and, and closing down corridors and things. Stuff that we, you, know, you wouldn't design it like this at all. And segregating the COVID and non-COVID patients was really, really challenging. Um, and I still look back, I don't know what, if we did right, if we did wrong, could we have done better? What we did do was change things very, very frequently. And we had to think about things that we'd never thought about, to be fair, with the flu plan, the flu plan like the clean lift and the dirty lift. Which lifts, which lifts do you take patients in? Which stairs do you go up? How many, how many sets of stairs do you need to go up? Which corridors are you on? Where's the CT scanner? AMU to CT to HGU involves two lifts at the very least and a travel along a corridor of about four, 500 meters and you go past a lot of offices and the canteen. So that's you know, not something we really thought about. And what would we, how could we have done that any better? Don't know. But the tagline, the hashtag on Twitter, teamwork makes the dream work. Uh, 
these signs went up pretty quickly. Um, so this is the high consequence infectious disease unit. This is the way into East Block from the back stairs. And my office is just over there somewhere. Um, and you'll, if you were up, you'll, this is what everything turned into. And there was this sort of strange displacement that a lot of the respiratory people felt about that we, were, we no longer had a home. And our home, which had been there for 20 years, was suddenly the COVID unit. And everyone started calling it the COVID unit rather than what, what, where, where, we, um, where we thought it was being home. But we did do this very quickly. Signage up, don't COVID go here. And, and interestingly, the, those who were doing COVID, you know, like, it's high consequence, don't in you go, fine, it's just the daily business. But orthopedic surgeons, they scared the bejesus out of an orthopedic surgeon. You know, they would wander along a bit lost, dazed and confused, accidentally at the wrong end of the hospital and see this sign and whoa, whoa, whoa. which is perhaps good. Um, because workforce, I'm going to talk about workforce in a minute, but one of the things that we never, the, the flu, pandemic plan never thought about was that you have to mitigate for a quarter of your staff being off at any one time. And we never thought about that. A quarter of your staff are going to be off at any one time because the, because the R value is so high. And then the shifting sands of you can't come back to work for seven days, 14 days, 10 days. You're infectious for 21 days. You need to be LFT negative or it doesn't matter. It changes every day. And, and one of the things we'll talk about later is moral injury which is very hard to define. But one of the things that, when people ask me, well, what's it like at work and why is it so bad and why, why is it hard? One of the things I found the hardest was not knowing what I was gonna go into the next day. And it's not a case of what patients will I see. I could tell you what patients I was gonna see. I was gonna see a 55 year old man who's overweight, who still smokes, who's diabetic and hypertensive and got COVID because he's a taxi driver and doesn't wear a mask. And he's gonna to go to HDU and he's gonna really struggle. And I'm going to have six of those people. So it's very predictable. What was not, what was unpredictable was what's the rules going to be today? Which registrar is going to be there today, if any? Am I, which shift am I doing? Is, is Robin going to be there or is he going to be isolating because his wife's got COVID? Or is he, you know, what, what the hell am I going to do tomorrow? I, I can't plan anything. I can't make any decisions about what my week is going to look like. And some people th thrive on that. I, I, I quite like chaos. Emma thinks I'm nutty. She, she really likes the Monday I do this, Tuesday I do this, Wednesday I'm off, Thursday I do this, GP. She knows exactly what she's doing. She, that's great. I thrive on, you know, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of the place. Um, that's why we do each of those jobs, not the other one, way around. I'd be hopeless. But this was a bit much for me even, you know, really not knowing what I was doing. And I think that's something we, we didn't think about. This is an example. We made up these posters, or they were made up for us. And one of the posters was what we made up and another poster was made up for us and they're different. <laughs> and they were given to us in the same week. And it's like, hang on a minute, which PPE were you using? If I look back through my emails from, from March through to maybe May of 2020, um, so much of it is what PPE do I wear? What should I be wearing? I'm, an out, I'm a nurse in outpatients this or I'm a healthcare worker and whatever. And I was very visible. So I, I got a lot of email. What should I be wearing? Do I need to wear full PPE? Do I not need to wear full PPE? Should I be wearing an FFP3 mask? Can I wear an FFP3 mask? And this is really difficult because there was no, no evidence base. There's nothing to go on. And, and we, had to, we, just, we were making it up. And I think getting a clear message through to your staff was, was something we tried really hard to do, but was very, very challenging. Um, and trying to say what is green and what is red and what is amber. If you remember, we had at one point like six or seven different pathways. There was a red and a green and a blue and an amber and a purple and a magenta and another one. I had no idea really what was going on because there was, you know, all over the place. Confusing, challenging, difficult. And one of the things I think that we as a group of people, you know, doctors, is important is confidence. You know, we like to be confident in what we're talking about. And when we don't, we step back and say, actually, I don't know what I'm talking about. I phone a friend. But for this, we were in a position, certainly I felt, where we, we had to be confident because we, we needed the public's confidence in us. But we didn't have confidence because we didn't know what to, really what, what to do. And I think that, that really was hard. I found that very, very, very difficult. Remember the two, to be two meters apart? So these are the things that were stuck in the two meters apart. Um, two meters is longer than you think. Six inches is shorter than you think, but two meters is longer. And this is me and one of the registrars um, trying to be cheerful and happy about being two meters apart. Um, 
What evidence base was for that? For, for that? Absolutely nothing. It was what was felt to be a reasonable thing. Um, and of course, what did that, what did we do? We defended that. It was we were told that by Public Health England, Public Health Scotland, by by the cell. We were told to talk about this, and we knew there was no evidence for it. And but we need the public to have confidence in us, so we stand by it. And that's difficult to do. It's very difficult when somebody comes up, where is the evidence that two meters makes a difference for one meter? Where is the evidence? Because in America, they're doing one meter. And in Germany, they're doing six feet or whatever it is. I think America is six feet, in Germany it's one meter. Why is England, why is the UK any different? Very difficult. We had pathways. We tried to separate out what was COVID positive, what was COVID negative, And we tried to um, work out how do we duplicate our work, but keep our standard up. And we work very hard in secondary care around flow. You'll know that if you've got anything involved with secondary care, it's all about flow. But there is a reciprocal relationship between flow and quality sometimes. Everyone knows this. The quicker you do things, the less time you spend on it, there's more chance that things go wrong. And we were in a position where we were having to do things incredibly quickly, and there had to be a lot of thought about making sure that quality didn't drop. And this is where I pay massive credit to my critical care colleagues who, if anyone took the biggest burden for this is critical care. I don't think anyone's gonna really, I mean, everyone had a tough time at critical care, I had a really tough time at it. And I mean HDU as well as at ICU. The amount that they had to go through in full PPE all the time, the, how, the severity of illness, the futility of the treatments that we had, watching young, Young people, well people die not knowing anything, not what they can do, with nothing that they could do was absolutely horrific. Um, and the critical care team, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I did critical care at, at, in, as a trainee and I have a lot of respect for them, but my respect is just to the roof for them just now. We wrote, we worked with, um, with primary care colleagues, some of whom are in this room, to very quickly day by day sometimes come up with new protocols for who goes what, where and when and how. We moved very quickly to you know, call handling and the dreaded consultant connect phone, but having those conversations rather than and going to someone who had, can make a decision rather than a phone call to the, the old SHO or to go to uh, someone who's just man managing beds, that was really, really important. That's going to be kept and something that we should maximize. But the willingness of you as a group to, be, to do that and the willingness of my AMU colleagues to do that, and the willingness to change every single week what these pathways were and adapt to it and move and change was incredibly, is, is amazing. This one is the one from, this is version three of this pathway by 9th of April. So we'd only been doing it three weeks and we changed it materially three times. And by the time we got to June, this was all about version 11, 12, and you know, we stopped numbering them by that point because it was, wasn't worth it. Um, Remember all those Zooms, those GP Zoom calls? How many people on a Zoom? 400, 450? When have that ever happened? And I felt very privileged to be asked to do those um, because you know you wanted a secondary career voice and you asked me to do it. Uh, and you could have literally had anyone in the, in the, in the hospital and, and to be invited back was, was a privilege. But it was great to be able to just have those conversations and I hope you felt that I was honest with you about what was going on and what, you know, what was working, what wasn't working and, and ask for help and offer help. And I think that I'd never really experienced that before in the previous 10 years of being a consultant, for, for, for better or worse. Um, but I felt very welcomed in that environment and, and hopefully, I, hopefully it was useful. And certainly the context that I've made against with some of the people in this room, that we continue to have those sorts of relationships, we continue to develop things, whether it's COVID related or, or it's the new cough protocol or it's asthma or it's whatever. So that's a really positive thing to me. This is a picture of me having spent four hours in HDU with my uh, FFP3 mask on. I'm not, don't look very happy, do I? But, uh, there you go. I think that was, I think I may have <laughs> deliberately not looked very happy. But I, this was this was nothing compared to the nurses who had burns on their faces from friction and things. But what? But two two lots of everything meant two lots of people, two sets of staff, um, and that's not just sets of consultants. It's all the admin staff, it's all the nurses, it's the the trainees and the domestic staff, portering staff. There was a couple of the uh, of the of the domestic staff in AMU 
who are the immigrant workers. They're not, they're, they were born abroad and came here. They're not paid very much money. They're a band one, possibly a band two, maybe. And they came in every single day to that AMU and they cleaned rooms where people had died of COVID. And they didn't bat an eyelid. They just got on with it. And in, in, when we talk about heroes and we talk about, you know, we've got, we give out some star awards and things. Those people have forgotten. I get paid a fortune to come and do this stuff compared to the average Joe. Um, and, and I get a lot of leeway in what I can do with where I do it. But those people are coming in day after day, not knowing if they would, they would catch COVID and die the next day. Many of them from our um, black and, and, um, and minority ethnic groups who we know were at really high risk. So um, I just mentioned that. I think that's really important to, that we don't forget about, about the people who made a massive difference. Um, PPE. What difference does PPE make? And getting used to it and getting enough of it. I spent a long time in this first few weeks trying to get goggles and masks and trying to coordinate people in the dental school and all sorts of things. And, and, and we've spent a lot of time focusing on that. Um, and did it make any material difference? I don't know. This is kind of what the, 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 um, the pathway became once we'd sort of settled into things. We, and this is what basically we did for about two years. We pulled the, the HGU team, of which I was one. So there were eight HGU consultants and we split medical HGU and COVID HGU between us. And we ran those units. Um, the respiratory and ID teams cross COVID, COVID and COVID HGU if they had the skills to do it. And then all our work that we weren't doing was backfilled by the medical specialties um, into the acute medical unit. And then, and then we pulled on all this range of different people to come in and backfill all of the work. And we didn't, we not planned for that. So these people, the academics, um, some of them had not done clinical medicine for quite some time. Um, and asking them to come back and, and run an acute take or run the general medical ward is very challenging for them if all they've done for the last 15, 20 years is a hypertension clinic. Retired colleagues were amazing. Older people are at increased risk of dying of COVID, um, but they would come in and wade in and Dylan Aswani came back and, and, and Alistair Mackey came back and all sorts of people came back to do this work. Um, but they didn't last very long, they didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> we just flung them in the vanguard. Um, it was so stressful, Dilip said to me, and Dilip is a robust individual, you all know. And he said to me, this is tough, this is really hard going. You know, I've been retired, I've got, you know, this is gone, my time is gone of doing all this and coming back, seeing just the amount of work, the physicality of it all, the mental strain, the decision making. This is, this is too much. I'm going to make poor decisions. I, I've got to leave it, which I thought was a very brave decision to, to come in in the first place and to go again. The anaesthetists um, ended up having to backfill ICU because the ICU people were doing COVID ICU um, and there's only so many shifts you can do when you're strapped with a, with an alien on your face for the 12 hours and then getting all the non-acute specialities to backfill there were all these crazy stories that we're going to get orthopedic surgeons to use bypass machines and get them ventilating for that was never going to happen um and i don't think it really did happen anywhere um but we did we did try and share the burden you know COVID positive wards getting um cardiologists doing a week the endocrinologist doing a week tough stuff and then we became a bit more famous so here's um this guy phoned me up. i was in bed on a sunday morning i'd done a night shift and I woke up and he woke me up about 10 o'clock Sunday morning and said, hello there, I'm Magnus Linklater from the Times. Uh, he spoke just like that. Um, and I said, yeah, of course you are. And he says, no, no, I'd like to interview you for Times. Uh, uh, and I said, oh, okay. And not really thinking about it because I was a bit dazed and confused. I was just woken up, um, having had two hours sleep, I just chatted to him and then it was in the Times the next day. It's like, and then I got a phone call from, uh, from Comms saying, did you speak to one of the Times? No, 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 not me, <laughs> not me, no, no. no. And then I very rapidly had some comms training. Um, but it, what that showed to me is that, uh, you know, that, that we, was, we, we were doing things well, actually, and it had been picked up that we were doing things well. And we were doing things well because of the communication between primary and secondary care, our willingness to adapt and change and move and get things, get things sorted and get things happening. But all the way through this, we were dealing with massive, massive uncertainty. And, and I think in my life, at the times I've been felt worse and been 
you know, bad times are always those times of uncertainty. I'm a kind of person like, I know, if I know what I'm doing, I'll get on and do it. It could be really, really hard, but I'll do it, it's fine. But not knowing, very difficult. And so here's a good example of what, something that happened in the first few weeks of, uh, uh, of COVID. We realized that people are very hypoxemic. The happy hypoxemic, the happy hypoxia that we've talked about. People come in with stats of 82% and they've been chatting away saying they don't feel breath and it's fine. But I teach the medical students that hypoxia kills you. So we had to give people oxygen. Um, and then we'd give more oxygen. And the more oxygen we'd run out, so then it was, right, well, what do we do? CPAP or high flow nasal oxygen? Um, and, well, hang on a minute. You can't give CPAP because it's an aerosol generating procedure and COVID is the most deadly virus we've known since plagues or plague bacteria, sorry. But, um, well, um, so we shouldn't do that. Uh, but then the intensivist told us, well, patients need PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, not high FiO2, because really the reason for that hypoxemia is that they're getting lots of collapse of the lungs, we need to blow them up a little bit. So we should give them CPAP. So we said, okay, fine. We've got six CPAP machines in the whole of the, of the critical care unit. So we then had to find 60 more machines and we, we found 60 more machines. We raided cupboards, we converted NIV machines and sleep apnea machines into, the, into, it, it, into acute CPAP. And we did all that basically over a weekend. And we wrote the protocol, I remember writing it, and I, and I trained up on, a, on, um, on War 42 about 25 nurses and 50 doctors over a weekend of how to use CPAP. Okay. And then a week later, I'm back on the weekend and we get reports from the intensivist saying, we're seeing a lot of barotrauma. All this CPAP you're using is destroying people's lungs and you need to stop using it because barotrauma is bad. You'd be better off on high flow nasal oxygen. Right. How many high flow nasal oxygen machines have we got in the whole hospital? Three. Great. So having spent all that time, and I told you about confidence is key, you know, telling all the nurses, telling everybody that CPAP is the key to this thing, and they said, we'll get through this if we use CPAP. The very next week, and then back saying, scrap all that, put them in the, well, we went back to high oxygen. And you'll know that a week later, we're back to CPAP again. And CPAP did become the mainstay treatment. So we were right, and then we were wrong, and then we were right. But all the way through this, we were told that these things are aerosol generating procedures, and that they need to be in a single room, you need to be using FFP3 masks, you need to be using full PPE because they are aerosol generating procedures. Now in that first three months, I got a lot of phone calls, emails saying, right, we can't do this service because our, our thing is an aerosol generating procedure. And the first thing was gastroscopy. And so the, GI, the Royal College of Gastroenterologists or whatever society there is, British Society of Gastroenterologists, BSG, decided that Upper GI endoscopy was an AGP, so it had to be done under full FFP3, everything. No evidence for that whatsoever. This Royal College just decided. And I can't say why, whether it's out of fear or concern for their members, but they said, if you're coughing because you're having a scope, that's an aerosol generating procedure. Remember that no one has ever said that coughing is, was, a, was a, an aerosol generating procedure on the ward, and no one put masks on people on Ward 17 when they had COVID. We wore masks. We didn't have COVID. They did, and then we left to stop it. But anyway, so endoscopy stops. It's an AGP. Stop it. I'm doing a bronchoscopy at the time, thinking this is strange. I'm in an airway. <laughs> oh well. The next thing they say is that colonoscopy is an aerosol generating procedure because someone somewhere has looked at the sewage in Chile and found some COVID in it, and therefore it's come through the stool. So COVID lives in stool. So it's an aerosol generating procedure. You can't do colonoscopy. And then Tony Nichol phones me up and says, we've been told by our colleagues that giving birth, parturition, <laughs> is an aerosol generating procedure. And I thought, well, it's the end of days. <laughs> How can this possibly be an aerosol generating procedure? I mean, okay, yes, yeah, she's panting and everything, I get that. But I said, I don't think you need to wear full PPE. You do not need to, it's giving birth. I, I don't think you need to do that. Um, uh, particularly if you've done, a, you've done the test, it's negative. But then the very next day, the Royal College said, yeah, you, you need to wear four FFP3 masks and the whole lot. So, so suddenly everybody is doing everything as an AGP and everyone's wearing the, full, the whole nine yards. Where does this come from? Where does this come from? It took until the 9th of June, 2022. So it took us two and a bit years to get to what they called a rapid review of AGPs, all right? To decide what is an AGP and what isn't. And one of my best pals, um, from university is a fluid engineer. 
I worked in Cambridge for some company being a fluid engineer, and we were talking on Signal because we don't use WhatsApp because that's, uh, because that's uh, part of the metaverse. Use Signal. Um, and he was just ranting about all this. You know, well, what is actually an aerosol How are they generated? And he got, you know, this is his life. This is a Cambridge graduate works in Cambridge doing this stuff. Um, yet he couldn't get through to anybody. He couldn't, you know, batting down doors and no one was listening. And two and a half years later, we decide that we can remove from the AGP list intubating people when they're anesthetized. If you're, if you're anesthetized and, and you're paralyzed, you're just putting a tube into a floppy thing. That's not an AGP. Manual face mask ventilation, NIV and CPAP and hyperlink oxygen. These are not AGPs. We spent an absolute fortune on PPE. Absolute fortune. For something which in the end turns out to be, did we need to do it? Now, I'm not saying that we were wrong. We just didn't have evidence. And we've known that this was coming. We had a flu plan. But no, and we had in that flu plan go, that we were going to use theatres to ventilate people, um, which was crazy because we didn't have in, anything like enough staff to do one-to-one -one ventilation. It had to be in a, in a cohort. But at no point did anybody in any hospital, never mind ours, anywhere, anywhere think, should we actually work out what an AGP is? We have that now. But the time and effort and the, perhaps more than anything else, the worry, the worry, the concern, the panic, the nurse, the cleaner, the porter, the, the HCA who's gone into a room with someone on NIV who's got COVID or even hasn't, and their mask slips because they bend over to clean something and their mask clicks up and they go, shit, I've got COVID now. That's the real thing that, 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 that I, I look back and think, what are we doing? This is Professor Sir Jonathan Van Tam, and I had the absolute privilege of hearing him speak at the BTS just before Christmas. Um, this man is an absolute legend, and um, having spoken to him, I, I just, I don't know how he's still standing, to be honest. Um, the, the, the stuff that was thrown at him and, 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 uh, and, and the, the rest of the, of the CMOs, um, he, he's an amazing guy. He gave the most amazing talk about what went right and what went wrong. And I, I apologize that this is a slide of a slide, but I couldn't find the slide. His first thing was, did we panic? Well, all the people who write to me on Facebook and say, what are you want about? I don't know anyone who's died of COVID. Detection bias. If you're 35 and you live out in the, in the ferry or on the car or somewhere and you don't know anybody who died of COVID, well, what are you talking about? Wild type COVID was 20 times more lethal than flu for older people. So anyone over than 60, 17.7 times, 17.5 times, 20 times between, between friends. And I think people really underestimate that is that why didn't we have swathes of people dying? Because we did an awful lot of stuff and people were isolated. We did do lockdowns and all those sorts of things. He says that he, that, you know, he will stand behind lockdown. Uh, you know, he will die on that hill for the wild type stuff. He says he wouldn't necessarily die on the same hill for the for waves two and three, but for the first wave, you would die on that hill. How about vaccination? Did we do right to vaccinate people in the way that we vaccinated? And this data is from him. Um, and the number needed to vaccinate to prevent a death for care residents is 20. Uh, and did we get out and do that quickly enough? Was it sufficiently prioritized? It's what the JCBI said. And there was a huge amount of kickback. And the, and the time it took to get out to vaccinating people um, that are 50 years and younger was six months, but the NNV is nearly 50,000. So vaccinating the right people at the right time quickly was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, and the evidence backs that up. But, um, but how you know, mobilizing a vaccinations force was again, not something that was in our flu pandemic plan. We didn't have a plan for, Okay, if the if it's flu that's that, that comes up, how do we get out and vaccinate ninety percent of the population, which is what we did for this, and it it's not helped by the fact that the vaccination thing all you know with with the uh, with the GP contract vaccination coming out of that and something else and it hadn't really happened and we were sort of in a state of flux and what do we do this certainly kicked that up the backside didn't it and got it going, um, and uh, and as as a very positive side effect if I need someone vaccine challenged because I want to, to challenge their immune system, I've got a really clear pathway and it gets done like that, bang, brilliant. 
the governance on that is much is, is amazing now. So which has come because we have these vaccination programs. Do you remember that there was a thing about whether you should wait and all the data, the studies were three weeks, vaccinate, three weeks vaccinate. And the JCBI said, no, it's 12 weeks, we're gonna wait 12 weeks. And there was hell to pay. And I wrote a Facebook post about this, explaining the science behind it, including what we vaccinate for other things and the rationale for doing it and the obstacle basis for it. And some colleagues absolutely tore me a new one. P people I would, would, would consider friends are still friends, respected colleagues. And they told me I was out there, you know, I was gone, I was off the reservation. The evidence base says three weeks, because that's what the study said. So when have we ever done that? I mean, yeah, we, we do things off license all the time. We do things, we do tri trials and things all the time, but suddenly they were massively wet wedded to it. But the truth is in public health medicine, the population matters more than the individual. And the key thing to do is get as many people vaccinated as, as, as quickly as possible. And getting that single dose into three N people is more valuable than getting two doses into N. And this was the original data that came from the AstraZeneca study, um, which was published and available at the time. Uh, and this is, uh, this is antibody levels. And the longer you wait, um, the higher antibody response is after the second vaccine. So the, the lab data was there, but people are really upset about this, really, really upset. And we didn't do a very good job of selling why it is that we should do it, but, we, but the JCV were right. This is what happened to the number of, of vaccinations that happened. Um, wild type before April 2021, and we went on to Delta. And you can see the number of vaccines that happened in the different strategies. So that's the 12 week strategy and the three week strategy. And by going to the three week strategy, we were able to vaccinate a hugely far, far more people earlier and it helped and it worked. And, and, and this is the data that shows that it worked. Um, this is from a Lancet paper, which um, that Lancet paper, in fact, which was only published in March of this year. Um, and it shows that your proportion of risk of infection was uh, slightly better uh, if you're on the 12 week strategy. So you're better protected, actually. And there's no difference between hospitalization. So the GCVI made a tough decision, but they made the right decision. Um, but they got a huge amount of kickback from that. Um, and this is data um, from a different study, Lancet study, uh, to show the same thing that if you, the longer you wait between vaccinations, the better, the better it is. Um, and that's uh, a photo from the, from the chair's view after John Van Dam finished. I have never, ever been to the BTS where someone's had a standing ovation. Respiratory physician's pretty lazy, we don't stand up. We really don't stand up. And he had a, like a 10 minute standing ovation. Uh, so I think that just shows that these are, the pe these are the people who bore the brunt of, along with intensivists and ID people, but and down south particularly, respiratory physicians bore the brunt of this disease, and they stood up for 10 minutes to the stand. Social media and bias. I spend too much time on Facebook and Twitter, too much time for my own mental well-being, I think, to be honest, trying to defend what, what we've done and how we do it, and try to help people understand um, the epidemiology and vaccinology, et cetera. But you get this, you get this. I can, what I see in my little world is what must be happening everywhere. I think it's raining here, but actually I, I can see it's not. Um, I've never, no one I know has died of COVID. I've not seen anybody who's ever had COVID. I didn't get vaccinated. I never wore a mask and I'd be absolutely fine. All these things, which are just personal bias. How do you get over that? Should we even try? 89% of Scottish people got vaccinated against COVID. 11% of people won't, and you may never change their opinion. This is like the politics thing. Don't try and, you don't try and persuade someone who's at the end of, you, you go for the floating voter. And that's what I decided I ought to try and do is if people are on the, on the edge, flip-flopping, they, they don't know, then target those people. The people, the pregnant women who won't get it because they've read some kooky thing on Facebook, on, on, on the internet somewhere, or I've seen a YouTube video. Um, uh, people who, who who honestly can't decide, you know, be the be the science with a ladder, not not the whole. Um, and and we tried our best, I think, as a community to try to get this information across. And I don't I don't know if we we're, we're doing it in the right way. To us, this picture on the left seems really clear. It tells you the occupancy of, of, of a room. It tells you about the whether you're wearing a mask or not. And it's very clearly a rag status of what your risk is. 
but the average reading age of someone in Dundee is what 12, 14, uh, something like that. That's what we have to aim for when we write our leaflets. And the average maths age is not much better than that. Uh, is that actually meaningful to you, to the average member of the public, or the per the person you're trying to target? Um, and the say for this, I think, is very clear to us. And they try to make things simple with an acronym. Um, but these things, people didn't like face coverings for lots of different reasons. People want to be in crowded places. They're, we're social animals. We're in a crowded place just now. Um, hand washing, we've been trying to do that since Jenna, and we can't manage that very well. Why two meters? We plucked it out the air. Um, and, then, and then, of course, there's a lot of people who still say, why do we bother even testing people? Uh, and, and social media had a big part to play in all this. I've already mentioned that I tried my best for all this and I've had some incredibly complimentary things from people literally I've met in the street in Tesco and then people I've seen in clinics and all, all, all that stuff and you did it over, over the pandemic was amazing and here I am at, it's September at 10 past 11 at night I just noticed um, you know writing these things and trying to, to make a difference and, and I think it's a real struggle there are people who still send me quite a lot of abuse on a maybe not daily basis but very regular basis telling me that I killed people and that my influence led to, 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 to deaths and still leads to, to, uh, to morbidity. Uh, and what do you do? How do you make these things a bit more interesting? How do you sort of get things across to people? There's memes and there's ways of changing stuff, but I don't think we've got it right for everyone as yet. And I'm not sure I have an answer for that. There are an awful lot of people who are very, very angry that we didn't use ivermectin. I had a, one of our, my colleagues that consulted at the hospital said, well, my, my parents are, are farmers and we've got a big tub of ivermectin and we've got loads of it. Should we bring it up? And, you know, what do they think? Said, no, <laughs> no ivermectin, no ivermectin. But people are really vitriolic about this and they still are, uh, but they just change what they're vitriolic about. Um, and, you know, why are you, divide, why are you hiding ivermectin from us? I'm not hiding it. It just didn't work. Uh, and the anti-vaccination sentiment spread very quickly. Do you remember this guy, this is an intensivist in London who was meeting Rishi Sunak, I think, or somebody, a politician of some elevation at least. And he very publicly said he wasn't going to get the vaccination because he'd had COVID and that was the best protection you could get against COVID. You don't need a vaccine. And any of us with any sort of vaccinology background, immunology background, oh, crikey. And of course, he has been proven wrong multiple times that the very best, the best you can get um, immunity you can have is a primary vaccination. Then you get COVID, and you get, then you get a booster. That's the best thing. Don't aim for that, you know, but that's the, that is epidemiologically the best. If you've had COVID, still get your booster. And the, um, uh, and it, people say to me, oh, vaccines have not done anything. Well, they absolutely have done stuff. They've wiped out diphtheria. We don't see polio anymore. This is not just, these didn't, these didn't go away by accident. And now, and, and you still see measles outbreaks. We still see a measles outbreak in America even. Uh, and I'm, I'm a big fan of this. This is the bullshit asymmetry principle. That the amount of effort required to spout a lot of bullshit uh, uh, is very small. And then the effort required to try to refute that is orders of magnitude higher. And I certainly did a lot of that. And I think a lot of us did that. And I think it's a lot of effort. It's a lot of time, and I'm back to moral injury. It's go, I get, you're all used to seeing, speaking to patients and telling them something, they say, oh, I don't believe that, and walk away. But this was huge, and everyone did it. And, it, and it's, I think we all just got, you just get sick of it, don't you? It's really hard. And I think that um, it's under-recognized how much this affected us. Good things, um, you're on mute, you know, uh, you're muted. <laughs> no, sorry cat walked across your desk all that stuff and zoom we're on zoom right now grand rounds is on zoom join every thursday at one o'clock the, the link is the same every week um and you can watch it on youtube um microsoft teams have everything on teams these days don't we and 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 this is you know this is the good stuff this is the really good stuff that that uh, that allows us to be far more productive I, you know i was on um, <clears throat> i'm going to i'm going to london on friday to the sac and i can do it from from my kitchen if i want to whereas it, it would have been two days to go to the sac um previously what have we learned have we learned anything um this is this is these pictures are taken two years apart i'm happier and i bought new glasses um so i was just being i was being interviewed for the bbc at this point um for the two-year anniversary so i'm miserable in this mask i'm cheerier in this mask and just this week no that's not true this this in the last month 
the Cochrane database people, library people, came up with evidence to show what masks do. So this is one of the big things. Isn't it? I remember writing a, a Facebook post in March of 2020 saying, I just don't know about masks. I think if you wear them properly, don't touch your face, don't touch your mask, wear it for a few hours, bin it, eat your meal, put another one back on, it's probably good. But if you keep touching the damn thing or you lick it or spray it, it's probably not good. I don't know, the evidence is not there, but try and use it properly. Well, the, this thing was published and immediately you get all this stuff. The mask mandates did nothing. Will any lessons be learned? To mask on that mask, why is this still a question when clearly the evidence based on this Cochrane review shows it doesn't work? And a woman sent, put on my Facebook screen, now will you listen? I've been telling you this for three years and you refuse to listen and people wore all these masks and their muzzles and the effect on people, psychological effect on people, and it did nothing. You've read it. It doesn't say that in the slightest. What it says is that physically, they didn't look at wearing masks. They looked at mandates. They looked at if you tell people to wear a mask, will it make a difference? And of course, it's because people don't wear masks. And they touch them and they lick them and they use the same mask every day for a month. So it's not going to work. It's like saying parachutes don't work because you try to reuse it. This, what they showed was, even with all that, we are uncertain whether masks of any sort help slow the spread of respiratory viruses based on the studies we've assessed. And they assessed over the whole space of time, and they used studies from before COVID, so they did SARS-1, SARS-2, flu, all sorts of things, include the COVID stuff, 16 studies. 16. And the bias in them was enormous, absolutely huge. They weren't randomized, they weren't controlled in any way, they didn't tell if people were wearing the masks or not. Some of them gave them the choice. The studies are terrible. Absolutely terrible. And as I was saying to probably a mandate to get everybody to wear a mask in the whole population probably doesn't do very much because you can't you can't expect people to use them perfectly. And in a low-risk environment like being out on the cars on your bike, it's of course it's not going to make any difference. You go going you go go walk up Cantool or go up Bynick Moor, you're not going to get COVID. But in this room three years ago, and one of you's got COVID, there's a really, really good chance one of us going to get COVID. And it, and it'd probably be me. Because <laughs> uh, they're not vaccinated, isn't it? So it's about context and place. And well, I was trying to explain this to my son yesterday, because he was trying to get his head around it all. He's a pretty bright lad. Um, I said, look, we don't all wear bulletproof vests all the time. And if we did all wear bulletproof vests all the time, gun deaths wouldn't go down. Because I'm not going to get shot anyway. Well, maybe I will from the Facebook stuff. But, but if I went into a war zone, I'd wear it. I'd bloody make sure I wear it. Put that bulletproof vest. So it's very easy to misinterpret all this stuff. And Tom Jefferson, I don't know the guy, Oxford person, has has been quoted as saying that masks probably do nothing, and then been quoted out of context. So what lessons do I think we've learned? I'm coming to a gradual and conclusion. I think. Quite rightly, I think, in the secondary care way of things, the front door will always take priority because that's where the sickest people are and that's where you need the resource and something's got to give. And what gave was surgery and what gave was outpatients and then clearly what gave was colonoscopies because they're an AGP. But you can't stop having babies and you can't stop you know, acute non-cover things happening. You can't stop cancer happening. And, and we didn't have a great plan for that. We had a plan, but we got punched in the face. And, and we, we felt were so busy trying to sort out the, the, the COVID end of things <laughs> that it swamped everything. Uh, critical care was a massive hit to think about how many different places we had critical, we had a COVID ICU. We had an ICU and a COVID ICU, which ended up in Taz. And then we had another one, which was down in where the old uh, World 31 used to be. And COVID HDU moved around three times as well. We were all over the place, just moving and shifting and bouncing around and every change caused problems. So what should we do? Well, when COVID has you know, died down, we should think of the future and that where's our big shiny new ICU with lots of beds in it? Well, where is it? We need to plan that, we need to do it now because if we're waiting for RSV 32 to happen, then it'll be too late because we'll be swamped again. I talked about staff absences coupling the service and, uh, and, it, re and it really did. And saying that we have to isolate and can't go back until your LFT's negative or whatever, that, 
again, not perhaps as well foreseen as it should have been. Um, and I say isolation and ventilation, we did the opposite for us. We all went into one room and closed all the windows. Um, and looking back on it, it seems a bit silly. I don't blame anybody. I think we were trying to do the best that we thought at the time, but we need to think about ventilation. We need to think about, you know, after a year, we went back to our offices and we, had, we went back to single offices, single occupancy. Because if one of, if we were shared occupancy, if one of us got sick, the other one had to isolate because that was the rules at the time. And that would double your absences. So we had, I had my own office for about a year and a half. It was lovely. <laughs> and now I have to share, share with Dave Connell, which is equally lovely. Okay. Um, but we didn't think about that. Surgical specialties, very complicated. We know that the, 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 the deaths were much higher. Outcomes were very poor. Um, and I think working out how we keep surgery going, whether we do it, you know, should we shift it all to Sacasaro? Should we have just said, you know what, shift everything to Sacasaro right now? I know it costs a fortune to shift everything, but just do it, move everything there. It's way above my pay grade, but surgical, surgical procedures just ground to a halt. And we had lots of surgeons sort of kicking their heels going, what we're gonna do here? And a lot of anesthetists who were busy doing other stuff. Um, what is and isn't an AGP? Well, obviously sensible decisions would be helpful. Recovery. The trial. What an amazing thing. We recruited into recovery, mainly because James Chalmers was a big push for this. Uh, and it was an astonishing study, and we would not have got out of the hole without recovery. And it makes you think, well, how, you know, why have we not been, why are we not so proactive for, for research for other things? We were so proactive for, for this, and we got so much out of it. And the patients, the public bought into it. It wasn't a hard sell to put people into recovery. They were, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've got COVID, do everything. If, if, do everything you can. I don't mind if I get placebo. If it helps someone else, just on, on we go. Um, uh, so I think we should do something about that. Um, working in different ways, hot clinics, virtual clinics, virtual wards, enhanced vetting. You'll know, undoubtedly, every one of you has been on the end of me replying to your referral saying, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about the other thing? What about this? What about the other? This is not me trying to fob you off. This is just trying to think, is there ways we can work that means that so was not waiting 18 weeks for me to say the same thing and just, you know, have a dialogue. And I know, you know I've written to you, you've written back. I've written to you, you've written back. And, and we drive things along. But we don't have a very good infrastructure for that. I want to put someone on a virtual ward that says, I, this patient is now in shared care between me and Simon. And we're going to work it out. And it might come to me, it might go back. But they're in this space and I can quantify the work. At the moment, it's I write a letter, you write another letter back, I write a letter, I go on holiday for two weeks, I don't get the letter, you go on holiday for two weeks. You know, it's not, but that actually has made a massive difference to us when it worked. And then emotional moral injury. I don't think we'll understand the significance of that for some time. Retirals, burnout. I've had very recently, and in fact, even in writing this talk, it's really made me think about what my career is and where I want to go, what I want to do. I have lots of different roles. I work with NAS, I work with Scottish Government, I do this, I do the other, I do some acute work, I do some chronic work. And it's really made me think, what do I want to do? Where do I want to be? Because another pandemic is absolutely inevitable. It is coming. So what are we going to do different? What will the lessons be that we learn? And if we did, if we plan to, you know, fail to plan, plan to fail. So where are the CPAP machines? Do I have to find 60 CPAP machines on one weekend in 2020, in 2028? And where is the oxygen? We ran out of oxygen at least twice, as in, you know, the tanks went dry. Um, who's going to look after these patients? So when COVID-29 happens, is COVID-29 a respiratory disease? Because COVID-19 sure as hell ain't. Not always. It's a GI disease. It's a disease of frailty. It's a disease that causes all sorts of weird and wonderful things. But so should it be all just respiratory physicians? I'm not saying that in a selfish way. I'm saying well, what's the best place for people to be looked after? Um, our COVID patients now spread out the entire hospital. If we don't expand our critical care unit, then when RSV 26 happens, that'll be the next pandemic we have decided, then we're gonna be stuffed. And then workload. Um, we work at 105% capacity all the time. And one of the things that I've been doing this week, along with Dave Connell, we've been looking at our waiting lists and how many people of them do we need to see? And, and, and is there a better way to see them? Is there a virtual ward I could put them on? Is this, what's long-term, condition management actually look like in a post-COVID world? Can I make it better? Can I, can I stop bringing people up just to say, everything's fine, okay, I'll see you in six months time. 
how can I support you in primary care to be able to do, do chronic disease management when we've reached a sort of you know, steady state of things? I don't, I don't know what that is. We're trying to work it out in, inf in infection. Um, we can look at very proactive things like infection where we do a lot of virtual work and then look at a less proactive area and see what the differences are. And in, in a non-judgmental way, it's just, it, is what we're doing making any difference? We absolutely have to have recovery two set up, ready to go. I think we, you know, as soon as wherever the next thing comes from, if it's metanumavirus 31 or it's RSV 26, we need to hit the ground running and, and one of the arms needs to be steroids. You know, we need to know first straight off if steroids work and then we need to be rattling through and we need to stop being worried about getting people into trials. We need to get that done. And then realistic medicine and value-based decision-making, you, you know, uh, you'll know that um, the CMO report has gone from being, um, I've pissed Simon off, he's, he's, I do this all the time. He's, he's on the swimming run, he's told me already. <laughs> See you later. Um, uh, yeah, the CMO went from realistic medicine to, to, to now it's, it's value-based healthcare. What value am I? And this is where I get a little bit uh, sort of misty-eyed and, uh, and introspective and think, well, what value am I? What value was I during COVID? What use was I? And what use am I now? And what use am I now to a service? What am I used to a patient? What am I used to, to you? Um, and how could I add value? And when am I not adding value to, a, to an interaction? When am I not adding value to a service? When am I interacting with one of you and not adding value to the process? When am I not helping in some way and I think about that a lot and I thought about it a lot whilst writing this talk actually um, and and one of the things I've been trying to do is engage more with ref guides so just try to get our pathways a bit better try and aim for more more communication and, and really get on the back of that goodwill that, that we had with the GP zoom calls back in 2020 2021 uh, and, and difficult conversations are difficult we sure as hell learned that um, you know when I was I, I will never forget the HDU ward rounds where I would see six people, all the same sort of phenotype. The 55 year old man who smokes, got diabetes, hypertensive, BMI of 35, probably got a bit of COPD um, on CPAP, day 15, uh, and his neighbor's on day 12, and his neighbor's on day 10, and they're all probably going to die and um, have the same conversation with them for seven days in a row and then phone them phone their wives, daughters, husbands, sons, and have the same conversation until they die. You know, that's gonna, that will live on with all of us who did it. For, and those conversations are difficult. Um, and if we don't plan better and have better information up front from the start, we're gonna ha continue having more difficult conversations. So I've done with this now. So um, my thoughts on, on all this is that we thought we had a plan, but we weren't prepared. We did have a plan and we kept signing it off every year. And we said, this is the flu pandemic plan. It looks good. But we weren't prepared to what would happen once we got punched in the face, that first punch in the face. But what we were was very nimble and we were very adaptive and we were very effective and we had fantastic collaboration, but by God, it was hard work. And I, I look back and think, crikey, I, you know, we all knocked our pan out back then, didn't we? We really, really did. Um, and I, and I, I think that you can rely on, on goodwill in that sort of crisis, but it does wane. And I think we need to know more about moral injury and, uh, and the effects it had on people and not ignore it and sweep it under the, under, the, under the carpet. Misinformation spreads faster than COVID does, um, but it probably isn't as virulent. I was quite proud of that. <laughs> uh, put that on a, on a T-shirt. I, yeah, I, I mean, misinformation goes around very quickly, but I don't think it has a lot of traction with most people. I think probably 80% of the people trust what we say and trust what the government puts out and trust the evidence, trust the JCVI. Um, but there are this floating voters in the middle. Um, but I think we have to have a better strategy and not just say, OK, well, it's gone now. Let's not talk about it. I think we need to keep pushing and, 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 and educate people. I'm not saying I said earlier on you that people that the average reading age is not very good. At, this is not to say that we should assume people are stupid. Far from it. People are intelligent and people are inquisitive and people, armchair epidemiology has become a new thing, but providing them information the way that we've always done it doesn't work. It's about trying to find ways we can communicate with these people who are interested and engaged and, and intelligent, but can't, but can't assimilate information the way that, that we, we can 
as, a, as a route. You sure as hell can't put a gallon in a four pint pot, as my granny used to say. Um, and if we don't sort out our capacity issues right now, then when COVID-29 happens, then, then I think we're in bother. There will be another pandemic. I suspect it'll be flu and that too shall pass. Um, uh, and whether I will stood up here talking to you again or whether I'll have managed to retire, I don't know. Um, but what it certainly has done is made me think very hard about what I want to be doing when that happens. Do I want, to, you know, where, where, what will be my role and what value will I be able to give to it? So um, that's what you voted for and that's what you got. I hope that, that was interesting. I suspect it's, you know, it wasn't a lot of slides of tables and graphs and things. And I hope it just, was interesting as much as anything else. Um, if you do want to know anything about long COVID, I'm very happy to ask to take any questions about it. Uh, or if you want to just get a phone, then that's fine as well. Thank you very much. Um, the plan is that we will try and run the questions from the audience here. We've also got chat online, so we're going to try where we can to um, field questions from both groups, if that's okay. Yep. Um, what I'll do is to start off with is to invite questions from the audience. Can I get I'll... a glass of water? Oh, well, yes, you get your glass of water <laughs> while people are thinking about the questions. Still. Uh, still fine. Um, and um, when people ask a question, you just say who you are. And what I'm going to do is going to repeat the question just so it can be heard properly online as well, so people online can hear that Cheers. question. So, any questions from the audience? Oh, we've got one question. Yeah. Hi. You, you touched briefly on, on race and uh, black men uh, and minority ethnic groups and, and how they were disproportionately affected. But do you think we got it right by just vaccination by age? Or should we actually have brought um, race into it? So, so the question is whether we should have brought the, um, the question of race into vaccination priority rather than just age. That is a very good question. Uh, what I can tell you is that the um, the post vaccination, the the disparity in risk has gone away, so that has narrowed down. So we don't really still understand what it was that made the made the difference. And what we, we also don't know whether if it's if you're black, or if you're Asian, or if you're Middle Eastern, or if you're Southeast Asian, is there a particular, which bit it is? They were all sort of lumped together in the group as they often tend to be, unfairly, I suspect. Um, and then you have the challenge of how do you identify people and do you ask people to self-identify because it, you're going to do it on surname, you do it on the census, the census always happens every 10 years, there's a lot of missing data. I think that it, it that you, I think yes, we probably should have uh, uh, based risk, that risk into it. I just don't know how we would have done it. That's the problem. Um, but I, I think that the risk was sufficiently higher in that group of people that they should have been offered vaccination earlier. Um, many of them, the people who died very early uh, from black and ethnic minority groups were doctors, healthcare workers, the, you'll remember the BMA, BMJ, in the BMJ, that publication of with all the faces, and they were as pre-vaccination. It's, it's very sad. I spent a bit, I, I went to Jordan in May last year to speak at the conference in Jordan. Um, so they're, they're, they have, uh, their population is so, uh, um, mostly Muslim, some 10% Christian, but an Arabic sort of gene pool, should I say, um, with some uh, sort of North African influence, but also some from the stars from the east. Um, and they didn't really talk about it very much, actually. I, I asked them questions about this because they noticed that there were differences for, in the populations for, uh, that, that they could see within Jordan, and they, they didn't really notice anything. So they couldn't say the Af that those with an African background were, were any more risk than those from a Pakistan or Afghanistan background or from the people who'd come across from Palestine um, and, and Israel. Um, so they, they didn't really have an answer to that. It's a great question. Another question? While you're still thinking, I've, I've got one. One of the things when you mentioned, and we certainly noticed it in general practice, was the speed of change. Yeah, we were we were forced into making decisions into changing our practice 
practices and changing our structures very quickly. Um, why, do you not, why do you think that hasn't lasted and why can't we keep that going when we come to make decisions about other things that need to change um, now that we're moving forward? Because we've shown that it can be done and we know that it can work and it can deliver. Yeah, I think there are one of the things is that is money. Money was thrown at COVID. You know, there was a pot of money for COVID, which based, which was if you could demonstrate it was a COVID, then it would happen. So simple, simple things like we had one ultrasound machine on the respiratory ward, which was the one respiratory, the one machine that we used. Well, there was two, but it was it's almost it's 15 years old and broken. So chest drains, tapping chest, tapping ascites. You know, we use this all day, every day, but there's one machine that worked. And then when we got the COVID money, we said, well, well we, need, we need more machines because we need one in A&U, one in 42, and we need it. And bang, I mean, literally three days later, we got three, four, five new, brand new sonocyte machines, top of the range, brilliant. So things that happened very nimbly and very quickly, and we're absolutely delighted, and our service is much better for it, but we've got none of this money for it. And, and I think that um, that is a, has a big, big impact when now x million pounds in deficit running it to the end of the financial year and everyone want, no, no one wants to hear my ideas for new things and changing stuff and they want to know what the bottom line is if i change this how much money will we save and i said well if we do this we can save money over the next five years of this at the moment what can i save by april um and i think that's that's one big thing i think this um the the one of the other things is that sort of fatigue that People were well up for it in March and April. Yeah, get on. I remember there being discussions from colleagues saying, if they want people in the Nightingale hospitals, I'm going to go. You know, if they, if they want volunteers, I'm going to, I'll, I'll go down there and I'll be in the Nightingale hospital. So, you know, they're going to uproot themselves on their families and go and do that. Um, and that was fine. We could do that. We could, we could run COVID as HGU because somebody else came in to backfill it. And somebody else, you know, the endocrinologist was coming in to do acute medicine and the rheumatologist was coming in to do bit of respiratory medicine that's all great and exciting and then it all wears off and it's like well i'm sick of this and they everyone just drifts back the academics just drifted back they've got grants to to fulfill they've got papers they need to write and it all just drifts away again and then the enthusiasts say oh it's great we've got these things done so quickly we can do it if we have an impetus to do it and it's that homer simpson meme isn't it you know just walking backwards into the into the into the hedge and disappearing um so I think there's those, those are what I, is, the, is the challenge. Um, uh, and I, I, I do look, you know, I don't want to go back to it. You know, we, I don't want to go back to that kind of panic situations, but there were some good things about mm -hmm. it, as you described. There was the, right, today you are the decision maker. It's your turn to do that, make some decisions. People would come to me and I go, right, I've looked at this like a decision and it would happen and, and stuff changed and, and it was good. And it felt like you were doing something. And now, if I want to write something, it's got to go through. It's got to go through committee. And that perhaps that is the right thing to do because governance is important. But you just sometimes feel like if I have to if I have to run through three walls to get this done, then will I even start? So it's a question about whether um, the lowering of oxygen saturation levels for treatment was a COVID thing or whether we should be looking at that sort of longer term. This is a great question and a personal area of interest for me. I, um, so the, the reason we made the decision was, was for... Um, was for rationing oxygen, okay? We very quickly realized that to keep everyone sats above 94, we were using a lot of oxygen and people were actually perfectly happy. Their PO2 was okay. They weren't coming to any harm. You know, we were doing multiple gases. They weren't getting acidotic. Nothing bad was happening. So we took the decision that we, that given that we stick a load of people on 80, 80, 92 all day long and everyone's fine. And the evidence suggests very nicely that, that you, there's no benefit of having sats more than 90 in any critical illness. Um, that uh, that we would do that, and, it, and we would save us oxygen, and it, and it really helped. But because people didn't come to harm from it, it's made us think, well, well, can we do that for more things? And that helps discharging people early. And if we had a robust 
virtual ward system, then we could discharge people early and then virtually review them and, and, and that would really help us. The British Thoracic Society launched their quality statement on aspiration pneumonia and community acquired pneumonia in learning difficulties yesterday. I went, I, went to the, I went to the launch because I could do it from my kitchen. So I went to the launch meeting on Teams or Zoom, whatever it was, um, and their guidelines for, for learning difficulties, aspiration, learning difficulties, community acquired pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia in everyone is now 94 to 96. So they've changed from 94 to 98 down to 94 to 96. And, and some of the people wanted to shift it to 92 to 96 and some wanted to shift it to 90 to 94. So I, it's coming. It's, I think it's definitely coming. Um, and anyone who's my age or more who at medical school were taught that the treatment for an MI is morphine, oxygen, aspirin, and whatever else it is. Um, uh, nitrate, there was a whispering <laughs> nitrate in the background. Mona, wasn't it? Yeah, um, and now we know oxygen is not the treatment for an MI, and we don't do that, and we don't teach that, and stop giving people oxygen, and I endlessly rattle on about that. Um, so I think that there will be, um, I, I there'll be another positive consequence is that we have much more tolerant to low stats now. I mean, for very much, I'm, I've got a lot. I, I knew, you know, I theoretically knew that it would be all right, but now I know it is because I've seen it and watched it. So I frequently lob oxygen on people when they're sat and, and I, and, um, although HEPMA starts in May, um, that means that although we, we can alter SATS targets on HEPMA really easily, it's just change the program and we can start with people 1994, save oxygen, get people home earlier and no harm will come to anybody. I think Munro keeps scratching his head. <laughs> um, we can just use to your privilege just to ask you one further question then. You said that another pandemic's definitely is inevitable. Yeah. Um, and one of the things you said is about what have you learned from this whole process? And I just wondered how far along the process you thought we were in terms of protecting other services, in terms of thinking what happened. Um, everything was pushed in to support COVID and the treatment of COVID but other services therefore suffered, such as, for example, cancer services. Yeah. And do you think we're any, any way forward at all in thinking about how that might be done in a future pandemic, or are we still at the we need to think about it stage? I think we're still at the we need to think about it stage. And, and um, they, it, it's interesting that, you know, I, I showed a couple of papers and I've got in the other half of the talk that I didn't go do, I've got papers that were published this week, you know, and so the evidence base is changing on a weekly basis and we can learn more and more and more stuff like the, the mask stuff and, um, and, and, and more about vaccinology and things. And I think that we need to not just go, oh, okay, that's very interesting, but say, well, actually that helps us decide what we do next time. So the one good study in that, Cochrane thing is that FFP3 masks probably don't give any added benefit to, a, to an FFP1 mask, a flu resistant surgical mask, if it's worn properly. So in the healthcare environment, we probably don't need to wear as many FFP3 masks as we were doing, so long as you wear your FFP1 mask properly. So that's a very really useful thing, um, and will save us money, and, we'll, and it's not so horrible, and et cetera, et cetera. And the AGP thing is really, really important because that means, well, okay, then we can start putting AGP things next to people that, that not AGP things next to other people. And, and that will help us in terms of our critical care space. Where can we give an IV? We can give an IV back on the ward again, rather than a side room. Our side rooms are very important. And, we start, and then we need to start thinking about, like I said, do we, do all, do we just shift all the surgeries to Castro? Do we move all the cancer services to Perth? Do we close Perth? Say, look, that is no longer an acute service because we need that to be a clean site where all the cancer goes and the surgery that's important goes. That's it's way above my pay grade, of course it is. But we're not at the point of making those decisions. And I think we're not at the point of making those decisions because we're having to deal with the massive budget deficit that's due in April. And we've got a big waiting list for people who are waiting to have their hips done. And we've got a big waiting list to catch for people who present late with cancer. And what are the excess deaths that are happening at the moment? Why the hell are they happening? Because we don't know. You know, it's the, it's the, you know, we had the wave, there's a backwash, and there's another wave. <laughs> and, and it's dealing with that. I, I think that we're overwhelmed by it all. But I hope someone somewhere is, is thinking about it. Um, because I don't want to be back in the same situation thinking, well, we knew about this. <laughs> we, knew, we knew about this. I gave a talk in 2023 about this. <laughs>
Final, final question. Yeah, oh, uh, oh, oh, Barney, yes. The rain was there on the back of the wearing of the shape of my apron. <laughs> <laughs> that was a question about whether there was any evidence it's worth wearing an apron. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a personal book where I had to keep it in the public review. So, nothing. Yeah. Mm. So, the Cochrane Review again came up with the same answer, which is that there is, with very low confidence, we suspect it doesn't do anything. But the WHO and I can't remember, there was um, the CDC wrote a critique of it saying that they didn't differentiate between different forms of transmission of, of, of different things. So if you're wearing a penny and someone vomits on you, that's probably a, you know, some use. <laughs> and if someone ha has a, ha is coughing actively without a mask on, then it probably is a some use. But wearing a penny routinely to wander around the ward is likely to be a minimal benefit if anything at all and the snaggles you get around the back of your neck and mm. stuck in a stethoscope but hand washing does work and you're back you know back to jenna we've known it uh, and um and and we all groan when they with the, when the um, infection control folk come and plonk themselves by the sink and watch to see how many times you wash your hands on the ward round but actually it, it makes a massive difference hand hygiene makes a huge difference Remember when you used to go to Debenhams or pick any of the shop that's not closed down and there'd be a squishy thing at the door and, and people would look at you really strangely if you hadn't squashed your hands. Where are they now? You can still squish your hands and wash your trolley in Tesco and that's probably a really good thing. Flu lives on, it lives around for a long time uh, on hands and on, on, on um, surfaces and it's, and flu can be ingested. So you get your hand on, somebody coughs on the thing, you touch that and then you touch your mouth. That's a good way of getting flu. Um, so, but again, you forget, we forget these things because everything just gets washed away as a one. Well, it's okay, it's all done. And the Cochrane Review says that the masks don't work, so we'll stop bothering. What it actually says is that hand washing probably does help. And, um, and, we, and we've known that for a long time. So I'm not the only person that's keen on wiping the trolley down before I go shopping. No, 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 that's <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Wipe, wipe, wipe down your trolley. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you trolley wash your hands? Yeah. Use your, Use your, um, use your squoosh of stuff. I think that, you know, that's going to be the thing that, that makes a difference. I, I remember being interviewed on the telly, and that sounds ridiculous, but I remember being interviewed on the telly and, and being asked, you know, what, what do I think would be the long-term consequences? And I remember saying, I hope that it becomes more socially acceptable to take time off work when you're sick. I hope that it's more reasonable that if you have a cough, cold, splutter, viral thing, you know, that your colleagues will say, don't come into work today because you don't want to spread that around. I hope it becomes socially acceptable to wear a mask if you don't feel very well because you're protecting other people. Um, and I hope that it's that it becomes commonplace that you wash your hands when you uh, more often and we just pay a bit more attention to to isolating yourself when you're not very well. And a couple of those things have happened, a couple. But how many people either themselves or know of a colleague who in the last little while on the practice whatsapp group said oh i've got covid flu or something or other but it's all right i'll come in mm -hmm. or said oh i'm not feeling very well but i'll work from home and it's like and you know if you if you're sick you're sick and i think it should be reasonable to be off work and, and i i think we we have a tendency to sort of you know, brute force through these things and come to work. You make poor decisions when you're sick. I don't want my surgeon to have the sniffles and a bit of a cold and be thinking poorly when he's chopping out my whatever. The same way that I don't want my physician to be making decisions based on, oh, I'm absolutely knackered, I've been up all night, I was coughing and spluttering, it's three o'clock and I'm, I've run out of things to give. You know, so I, I, that's something I really think, I, I, I wish would happen, and I wish would happen, that it's acceptable to be sick. Because sometimes you are. But wash your hands, you know, I guess. Well, I think we've probably overrun our, our time. Thanks very much, Tom. Yes, so thank you very much for, to, to Tom to come speak. And uh, thanks also from the, the guys online for a couple of nice comments in there for your, for your appraisal. Um, <laughs> I had that. Um, <laughs> next year. Um, and thanks uh, to Kirsty and uh, Julian, my line there. Um, for 
uh, organising such a lovely evening. And thank you all for coming and for the brush to cars on the way. Because according to Kirsty's computer, it's minus one outside. So hopefully we'll do this again soon. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Thank you.